information resources and faster and more reliable technology. Higher performance. All right, uh, and I'm kind of a walker, so it, as long as you guys can see me okay, I'll stand down here. My apologies to the guy who has to use a camera and follow me all the time now. Uh, my name is John Overbaugh. I'm the founder and owner of InfoSecure, uh, a local firm that does uh, information security consulting, kind of uh, creative on the name. Um, and the talk I'm giving today is about building a secure development lifecycle. Uh, I've done this twice now for companies that I've worked for, and I do it uh, quite often now for companies to consult with. And, you know, there seems to be this prevailing concept that, one, building secure code is difficult, and two, developing, coming up with a secure development life cycle is a very expensive process that requires bringing in large companies with big bills uh, like uh, Sigital. And uh, I can tell you from my own experience that that's not the case. In fact, uh, you really can do this on your own without any outside help. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to tell you what your secure development life cycle should be because uh, that's sort of your decision, not mine. Um, it depends on your culture, it depends on what you're trying to build, it depends on your regulation and so forth. What I'm going to talk about are some of the strategies that I've used in the past to build a secure development lifecycle, talk about some of the resources that are available to you, and answer any questions that you might have as we go along. Please don't uh, be afraid to interrupt in the middle of the presentation. I do have a question. How many people here are actually developers, write code, uh, and then how, how many are managers and how many are infosec okay all right good great so um, the first question you have to ask yourself is what is a secure development lifecycle and the way I like to talk about it is simplified it's the tools the skills and the processes that, that we need to build increasingly secure code uh, I, I never say to build secure code because how do you measure that? What is secure code? What's secure today will not be secure tomorrow. The idea is that it's an iterative process. Having an SDL is really all about moving from being reactive to being proactive. That's, that's, all, that's all it is. Reactive, um, well, proactive in terms of what hackers are doing today, proactive in terms of the, the current um, attacks, but also proactive in terms of regulation and other requirements. So um, it doesn't cost significantly more to build secure code than it does to build insecure code because in the end y you're typing characters on a keyboard, right? In the end you're writing a line of code and you can either write a secure line of code or an insecure line of code. It takes about the same amount of time. What it does take is some knowledge and um, some understanding of what secure code is and what it looks like. The things we'll talk about today, we're going to use a lot of waterfally terms only because Waterfall was first. Um, I'm very agile in the way I like to work and the way I, the teams I like to work with and so forth and everything we'll talk about will fit well into agile. And it does apply both to one-time projects if you're building code for uh, in, uh, an IT organization but also for product software that's going to be iterated on over and over again. So in, uh, to start out I want to throw this image up on the screen. This is the Microsoft SDL. And really, honestly, this is about how simple it is to build a secure development lifecycle. Sit down and think about the processes, and like I said, these are very, very waterfall processes, right? Training requirements, design implementation, verification. But if you're agile, and I have some slides in an appendix, if we get to it, we will. If you're agile, you may be doing activities in each of these columns all at the same time. You may have a piece of code that's in verification right now while you're implementing something, but oh, you got to work and at 9 a.m. you have to go do a, me a meeting to talk about requirements with some of your users. Okay, so that's how it kind of fits in, in Agile as well. Throughout each of these phases, Microsoft has some recommendations of different activities that you might want to do. This is a secure development lifecycle. It may or may not be your secure development lifecycle. A secure development lifecycle is basically kind of a, a document that describe, describes a process that includes some or all of these that may have some gates for when you get to exit a given uh, phase. Whatever works for your organization, this is kind of a model for it. What we're going to do today is break this down. We're going to go through each of these phases and talk about kind of the goals for each phase and what you might want to do during that phase, the, the things you're going to look to have. We'll start with training. Like I said, it's just as easy to write secure code as it is to write insecure code. You just need to know what you're doing. And that's what training is all about. And the goal is to prevent the mistakes. How do we get training? Well, um, 
you know, there's a training program that I talked about a little bit here uh, that a friend of mine at Salesforce implemented. And now uh, Cisco, I was at the uh, IC Squared Security Congress in October, and the person in charge of the Secure Development Lifecycle Training at Cisco presented on their program, and it's pretty much the same thing. They call it the Security Dojo. Um, they did sort of a karate belt approach to training, where everyone got fundamentals, so it's kind of like your white belt, and then people that went ahead and did some OWASP top 10 by technology got a yellow belt, and so on and so forth, where you know, people who maybe go get their GSSP from SANS become kind of the experts once they've done some applied training. Do you have to go outside to get all this training? No, not at all. We'll talk about that uh, down the road a little bit. A lot of this is stuff you can learn on your own. I have, um, I've done a number of certifications. You know, I've got a GWAP, I'm CISSP, I've got some other SAN certifications, but I've actually not done the GSSP yet. I, I'm self-trained, I read a lot of books, I look on the internet, um, I talk to a lot of people. When, uh, when I find a vulnerability in a client's code, we talk about that vulnerability, I learn through osmosis. And that works very well for me and it works for a lot of other people. The key here is to have the commitment to learn. I've worked with so many developers that are just like, I don't want to hear about it. You know, either A, it's not a security bug, right? I'm the smartest guy in the room, you're not, it's not a bug. Or B, okay, fine, it's a bug, tell me how to fix it. I'm going to go ahead and write this very same bug tomorrow. And you're going to tell me tomorrow how to fix it because that's how much I care about my career, right? It all depends on you and your attitude and your team's attitude, okay? When you move to the requirements phase, really the goal of requirements is just to determine how much security is enough security. How much do you have to pay to figure that out? Not very much. You have to take some time to understand your clients, your internal expectations, and your regulation. I have a really interesting conversation with uh, business leaders quite often where I'll sit down and say, okay, how secure do we want to be? And they say, we want to be secure, secure everything. We want all the security in our code. Great, okay, so I think the bill for that will be about $750,000 because here's what we're going to do. All of a sudden, all of the security things are no longer as important. And as you talk cost, you begin to figure out what your company really wants to do. And what you'll notice is there's usually a gap right? You want this much security and your company wants to pay for that much security. All right, but really building a secure development life cycle d is part of the requirements phase is really figuring out what is, how much security is enough and what's your risk and then also setting what the engagement process is going to be like. Okay, so figuring out when the rhythms are, feature reviews, when, when you sit down and look at new features and review them for security, how frequently will you do that? How will you measure security? What's the definition of done? When do we know that we're finished with our security? These are some of the things that, that you're going to think about coming into your requirements phase. And then put them on a schedule. Put them in your backlog if you're agile. Put them on your calendar yeah, otherwise. Make sure they get written down. And that's one of the key themes for your own SDL is that you write it down. A lot of people, especially people in agile, hate that idea. And this really is the one place where we kind of break with the agile concept of not having a lot of documentation. Really, we want to have the SDL documented and the activities in the SDL somehow integrated into your, your um, processes. A lot of people think, well, I'm agile or I'm, I'm uh, uh, water, waterfall agile, which I call water fragile, um, or we're just random cowboys. But you know what? No matter what your approach is, you actually do have an approach. It may not be written down and defined in IBM Method Blue with 100,000 pages of documentation. You have a culture. And the idea is to figure out how to integrate your secure development practices into your culture. So it takes some definition and it takes some observation but it can be done. Okay, design phase. This is where we're sitting down and trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to build this new feature? How are we going to build this new product? And here's where we start to really talk about how are we going to meet these security and privacy requirements. It, it, the idea here is that we're not backing into the security of our application. We're actually planning ahead and thinking about ahead. And that's the only real difference with a secure development lifecycle. Like I said, we're being proactive instead of reactive. What third-party components are we going to use? And let's do a review of them before we do. I can't tell you the number of times that I've done pen tests or static code analysis for clients who have taken on third-party dependencies 
And the holes in their applications all came through their third parties because they didn't think about them. Um, in fact, we had to do a major uh, bit of work because I had a client building um, mobile applications in the healthcare space and they picked up a, uh, a, a platform so they could write, you know, iOS and Android at the same time. And it turns out that that platform, unbeknownst to them, was caching all sorts of data. And we discovered it in a pen test, and it took them a couple of weeks to really figure out how to get the cache data out. And the root, uh, root cause analysis for that was simply, we picked up a framework because we knew it was going to accomplish what we wanted to do, but we didn't have the time as developers to analyze the framework to figure out what weaknesses it introduced. And that's really what this design phase is all about, is figuring out if I'm going to take on a dependency, what's it going to do? Read the documentation, play with it, do a little bit of pen testing on your own, look into it a little bit and figure out what risk you're taking, okay? I like to talk about the ABCDE of security. When we're doing iterative software processes where we're, maybe it's a product that we've built or something like that, I like to ask questions about A, B, C, D, and E. Actors, are we going to change in this phase of our product design? Are we going to change who interacts with the application? Maybe up until now the application was internal only, but now we're going to open it up to external clients. Well, that really changes the world, right? It changes all of our risk assumptions, and it changes the technologies that we're uh, dependent on, upon and so forth. B is business. So what are some of the changes that are going to happen? Like I've got clients that, that have come to me and said, hey, up until now our product does not contain any HIPAA regulated data, but we want to change that. Okay, that's a, that's a business change. Channel, you know, a lot of times we'll build, <laughs> I worked for a company once that you know, had a bunch of HTTP uh, um, applications, HTTPS applications. They wanted to move to mobile, so their answer was to take... Um, Node.js server and scrape their HTML pages and then manipulate them into something a, a, a mobile application could consume, right? It's, it's a strategy, maybe not the best strategy, but it's a strategy and it's a decision people need to make and talk about. Data, what, what data are we going to store in the system? I have a client who we um, have always had this requirement that there will never be any PHI stored on a mobile device. Well, they, they, they decided recently that there may be a business case for that. So we had to do a business case review and talk about the security of it. And by the way, this client's very agile, very small team. There's about 10 developers total. We did that business case review. It sounds so formal, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like we all flew into a major city and you know, got a bunch of whiteboards out and stuff like that. No, we did it in an hour. We just did a phone call documented the results of the phone call. This is how we do agile in healthcare world. We have these quick calls. We do a lot of stuff on Slack. We document it with email. Um, and we have a, a place where we store all these emails. So when regulators actually show up, we can show proof of, oh yeah, here's our feature review for XYZ feature. Okay. Finally, environment. When are, if we're going to change the environment, you know, what happens today? Ooh, we, let's go take advantage of the cloud. So we, we're running stuff in, in on-premise servers, and we're going to pick those on-premise servers up and move them into VMs on the cloud. What could possibly go wrong? Okay. So these are all things in the design phase that we think about. I love the, the, the idea of just A, B, C, D, E. Just keep driving that home in your mind. What's, you know, what, what is changing this time around? Okay. When we get to implementation, Here's where we talk about, you know, like users, what, what we call requirements and waterfall are the user stories and abuse cases in, in our agile world, all right? And during implementation, we want to make sure that the code that we've designed and hopefully we've architected in a secure manner, we want to make sure it's implemented in a secure manner, right? Are we avoiding cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, SQL injection vulnerabilities, the real easy things? This is where um, I'm a big advocate of static code analysis. It is the cheapest way to uh, prevent or find a lot of these low-level, simple um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities. And so, yeah, question. Um, I, I actually, uh, my business, I own uh, check marks. They're actually here if you want to get a demo of them. It, it's a great tool. Um, I work... I, I consult for a major financial organization right now. They use Fortify. Um, I'm a big fan of check marks. You can get some of that functionality out of Breakman and Lint and so forth, but to really get a good scan, you want to invest in a tool or find someone who will do it as a subscription service for you, which is one of the, the services that I offer for, for my clients as well. Um, and when it comes to the shoestring budget, this is where I recommend you break a shoestring. 
spend the money it takes to either acquire a static code analysis tool or to use someone on a regular basis to look at your code. And the more frequently you look at it, just like anything agile, the more often you look at that code, the, the, the faster you find the vulnerabilities, the easier it is to fix them. Okay? Um, and, you know, this is a great time for all that training to be put to use. I teach a course called um, OWASP Top 10 uh, Programming Countermeasures. It's about a six hour course. And you would think, with all of the talk now about web vulnerabilities and stuff like that, you would think that that course would be boring, that the developers would never hear anything new. I mean, how many times have we heard about SQL injection vulnerabilities, right? It amazes me, though, every time I teach the course, how many things people learn. And uh, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll combine, I'll do static code analysis, and then I'll take the results of the static code analysis and actually put it into the course as the sample code of what not to do. It, it's hilarious to see the finger pointing, right? Oh my gosh, that's Joe's code, look at that. <laughs> it's really incredible to see that kind of live interaction and see developers recognizing their own code and their own mistakes. The, the very simple basics, it's, the OWASP top 10 is just the top 10. It's not all of the ways you can write vulnerable code. However, it's the 10 most common ways that you can write vulnerable code. It's a great way to start for two reasons. Number one, it teaches developers how to write more secure code. But two, it really just raises awareness. And developers start thinking about SQL injection and, and stuff like that. Really, the goal of, of your training in this phase or before this phase, the goal of the, um, uh, of the impact, is to have your developers ask the question, what could possibly go wrong? Because what does a developer focus on? Features. That's right. They never think about the unintended consequences. I had a really cool experience this year. I got to speak with a, a company I'm actually going to work for in, in about a week um, at CES. Okay, we, the, the, the company has started a cybersecurity summit at CES, which is actually really well attended, which is probably a good thing. But I had the opportunity to wander the, the, a couple of different floors at CES and look at all the new devices and all the really new cool things that are out there. And I kept picking these things up thinking, what could possibly go wrong? What are the unintended consequences of this device? And it was amazing. I mean, you've got healthcare devices. Or you've got shirts that you can wear that have sensors in them, right? So what happens if I can do something in, in like actually send sh shock waves, you know, uh, uh, electronic pulses through the shirt instead of reading them. Just all sorts of really wild things. The automotive place was really scary. Self-driven cars. People didn't really like me because they kept asking, hey, who, who does your security? Like, how do, you, how do you figure out that these things are secure? And <laughs> they didn't really like having security people ask questions about their, their product. I don't know why. Uh, and make sure in this, you know, one of the things that a lot of people have success with is making sure they have unit and acceptance tests integrated into their, uh, including security. And keep in mind during your implementation phase that secure features are not the same as security features. How many times have we had uh, gone to a client and our VP of engineering, who used to code, tells the client, oh yeah, we're secure, we use, we use uh, Windows form, Forms-based authentication and HTTPS. We're good. Okay? So keep in mind that every feature needs to be written securely, not just the security features. And by the way, we're having some explanation about how to do secure code. We're going to jump to how to build an SDL in a minute here. So verification phase, and I'm going to try to go a little bit faster. Verification phase, the opportunity to validate your security features. Okay? So if I built a login, let's make sure the login works. It's also your opportunity to make sure all of your features are implemented securely. This is where you do fuzz testing. This is where burp comes in really handy having it, knowing how to use it. Best investment you can ever make in security, $300 for Burp. It is the most powerful tool in the world. A lot of times I'll do RFPs and people will ask me, well, what tools do you use? And I'll say, I use Burp and the command line. And well, what about all these, you know, they list all these dynamic analysis tools and all this stuff. And I'm like, no, I use Burp and the command line. What, <laughs> what do you need all the other tools for, right? Burp has a great scanner in it, actually, that works pretty well. So it's a good dynamic scanning tool. You can check that box. But really, Burp just puts a lot of power in the hands of the person that's using it. This is where your agile abuse cases will be used. And this is where you confirm your logging, auditing, and incident detection capabilities. We'll talk about that in a minute. The time to find out that you don't have auditing, logging, and incident detection capabilities is when you have an incident. Don't, don't learn about it then. Okay? I just wrapped up an incident for someone. 
Uh, we got away really, really cheap on that one. Uh, but uh, they learned a lot about their systems and what they don't have. Uh, they were lucky. Okay, release phase. This is when you want to make sure you have an incident response pad. This is when you conduct your final security review. I had a boss that used to talk a lot about uh, the NASA red light, green light. And this is really where you want to do your security red light, green light. Have we done everything we need to do to prove that the product is secure enough that it can go out the door? All right, and then this is also where you want to certify your release and archive your bits. Why would you want to archive your, your code? Any ideas? If you have an incident response and you guys are 17 features down on, the, on, the, on the, the main branch and you need to do an incident response and you can't unravel everything you've coded, you're about to force 17 new features out into production to, to resolve your issues. And I've seen it happen and it's very painful and very ugly. The other thing that happens that I've seen, worked for a company, I found a, a, a wonderful critical vulnerability. It was awesome. Um, there was a password reset feature, and as a convenience to their clients, um, they had this concept of a default password. So, you know, if someone forgot their password, you could set the default, you, you just reset it and say, oh, well, it's the default password, and everyone in the company knew the default password. It was very convenient. Well, the problem was that the default password was actually sent down with the password reset form where you would request the password reset. So you'd, you'd click it, and it would auto-populate your next password login screen with the default password. R really convenient, right? And it was in the HTML source. Okay, stupid. So we fixed it. That's great. Um, three months later, a new release went out, and, and guess what was back? Okay, someone lost the change. So y taking good care in the release phase of your bits is really important. And then finally, uh, response phase. Th this is not the time to find out that you don't know how to do response. It's very, very expensive to bring someone in to do response for you. Um, my clients I, are lucky. I'm a terrible consultant. I don't, I don't charge what I should. But, you know, if you actually have an incident where you have to bring in an incident response team like Mandian or someone like that, you pay through the nose for it. And when you could have prevented it or at least made it a lot easier by actually preparing your incident response. Okay, so this is, this is what an SDL is. Okay, so now let's talk, let's go, well, any questions to what an SDL is first before we go on? This is kind of the core components of a secure development lifecycle. Clear as mud, right? Okay, good. All right, so how much is it going to cost? So you'll notice here, my, my wife yelled at me. She's like, no one can read that. And I kept saying, yeah, I know. That I just want you to remember that we had a slide on training. Okay, right there. Um, what do you think you would need in the training phase? What's the goal of a training phase? Build competency. Build competency. Yep. It, what sorts of competencies would you want to build if you were going to train a product organization? I was going to stop and get candy bars, and I just I ran out of time this morning. I love throwing candy bars out for answers. But. Uh -huh. So you want to build awareness of, of not all the different ways something can go wrong, but awareness just of the fact that things can go wrong. I, I like to talk about developers who've not been trained in security. I compare them to owning a Rottweiler, which, you know, a lot of people have this really negative impact of a Rottweiler. They're just as safe or dangerous as any other dog. But think about a Rottweiler that's not trained. So you have all this power and all this strength with absolutely no self-control. Welcome to the world of developers. Okay? So um, here are some basic things that you might want to train about. One would be your SDL process. probably want to teach people how to follow the SDL you've designed. Um, it would actually be very difficult to argue that you have an SDL if you can't produce to a regulator some aspect of training around that SDL. Other things, um, th threat modeling, right? So typical block and tackling aspects of secure code. Uh, you would probably want to teach some secure coding and, and guidelines and then also offer individual training on coding and testing. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but you, know, you probably want to have um, one or two experts in your company who really, really know about secure coding and or who are really good pen testers because they can be on loan. Those services aren't needed 24-7. But you know what? Every week or two, someone's going to pull on them. So send a couple of your people away to a SANS course. You probably don't have to have everyone go and get certified in Java or .NET, but having one or two people do that is a great idea. Okay? So how much is this all going to cost? Well, you know what? I mentioned earlier, I'm pretty much all self-trained. I do have a GWAP, so you know, I spent a fair amount of money on that. Everyone knows how much SANS training costs. 
Um, and, you know, you might want to probably send someone to good code training. Uh, and maybe, you know, incident response training, you might want to get one person uh, with a GCIH certification. So you've got, you know, any level of investment. But really, honestly, all of that stuff is available freely. As long as you find someone who's passionate about them and give them the opportunity to be trained or to train themselves, that's what's important. So your training budget could be anywhere from zero to 24,000 if you want to send people to, what, three or four SANS courses, or higher if you want to send more, okay? So here's your shoestring budget, training. Where are you going to find your best training? Uh, OWASP is a great source for it. We're going to talk about sources in a minute, but just, you know, it's out there. It's everywhere on the Internet. Requirements. What, do you, what are your goals during the requirements phase, and what do people need to do to accomplish those goals? Ideas? So the requirements phase is where we're trying to figure out how secure our application has to be. We've got to understand regulation. And again, you can bring in consultants. And sometimes it's a good idea, right? If you have someone, if you're moving into the HIPAA space, and you can reach out to a consultant and pay them three or $4,000 to come in and help you understand how HIPAA will impact you, that may be a cost savings. But on the other hand, you may want that training internalized into your team. So you might want to train, have someone spend time reading up on HIPAA, reading up on how to, how to write secure, codes in the HIPAA, uh, secure code in the HIPAA space. In fact, that's a book I really want to write. I wish I had time to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it isn't rocket science, actually. There's just there's not a lot of regulation ar around it. It's more about documenting what you've done. This is also when you want to have the ability to write good user stories and the definition of done. What's interesting is when it comes to user stories, there's a, uh, a project called Safe Code. It's a little bit old. It's been around for a while. Basically, Microsoft, Adobe, some of the big uh, vendors five or six years ago realized they missed the ball that OWASP had really beaten them to the punch on a lot of this stuff. So instead of piling all their energy into helping OWASP, they said, oh, let's build our own. So they built one called SafeCode. Uh, it's a, very redundant, except they have a fantastic list of user use cases, user stories for Agile. You can literally copy and paste them in, depending on your, your organization's maturity. SafeCode is the link. Okay? So you know, how much does it cost to define what done is? Uh, half an hour? Well, I'm sorry, let me try that again. Half a day arguing with a bunch of developers, testers, and program managers, right? It's not that big of a deal. All right. Um, in the design phase, design needs, really, again, this is a zero-dollar investment. You need to understand you, your um, security review and documentation. How are we going to conduct a security review? What is a security review? It's looking at a feature and asking yourself, what could possibly go wrong with this feature? Based on the answer, what are our requirements to make sure the feature isn't broken? Okay? It's, this is a low-cost thing that you just design into your SDL. Um, during the implementation phase, this is one place where, like I said earlier, I advocate spending money. Static code analysis is probably the cheapest way to prevent vulnerabilities, either by engaging with someone who will scan your code for you on a regular basis, or by purchasing static code analysis tools. You can start small. Lint is a great start. Breakman is a great start. Right? There's some things that you can do almost for free. If you're running a mobile application, you can do sort of a combination of static binary, uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, Quark is a tool that was built by LinkedIn that's now open source. It's a great tool for analyzing Android uh, binaries to look for most common vulnerabilities, things like, you know, uh, intents and so forth, uh, that kind of stuff. So there are some free tools out there. Um, they're not going to cover everything, but they'll get you started while you're trying to make decisions on other tools. Um, so that's your big spend of static code analysis. But other things you do, code review. How much does it cost to learn how to do a code review? Not much at all. Sit down, look at the code. I, one of my, f my favorite code reviews that I ever did was, was my very first one. And we were looking at the logic for the login page. And uh, in the login class, there was a Boolean, is authenticated equal to true. And then it went through a series of checks. And if it failed to check, it set it to false. Okay, Upside down logic. What happens if I break somehow in the middle of that authentic authentication process before true gets set to false? It's true. If I can break out of it, I move forward. Okay? That's the kind of stuff that you do in a code review. It doesn't take a lot of money to, to, to train it. You just have to decide we're going to do the code review and then sit down and get it done. Okay? Security unit tests also need to be written at this point. Uh, and by the way, uh, I call out in, in design phase, I called out security standards. 
And in implementation, I call out security guidelines. Standards and guidelines, documentation. Uh, if you're agile, you're freaking out about this, right? And in most cases, I agree. However, in an organization that writes software as a main component of their business, having written standards that say things like, we will only use the following encryption would be a great idea. Drown. Uh, how many people heard about Drown last, was last week, right? Okay. If you had a security standard for what SSL you would support six months ago, what would your standard have set? Minimum level for SSL. TLS 1.0 or above. SSL itself? No. Would you be vulnerable to drown? No. How many people have a standard for what level of support they give to SSL? A couple. A couple do. There's a lot of value in writing those standards and also guidelines. How many times have you seen encryption implemented poorly? Oh, I forgot to salt it. Right? Or, um, you know, just a number of different ways that you can break it up. So having written guidelines. And this is a concept that I've come up with called SDL in a box. And I swear, if I just had a year to sit down and do it, I would. Um, where you, uh, you know, you could just inherit these standards and guidelines instead of having to write them yourself. They're kind of out there. The OWASP developer guide is pretty good. And a lot of the cheat sheets for OWASP are great. Um, so that stuff is available. Really, you want to grab it. There are, there are, these are just patterns. Right? They're just security patterns instead of patterns for accessing a database or patterns for logging people in and so forth. Okay? You want to write those down. That's, that's an, a time sink, um, but it's worth the effort. It really is. Uh, verification phase, this is where you're going to do feature level pen tests. So I wrote a new feature. I'm going to give it to my pen test people to have them look at it. Do we pen test every single feature? No. What we do is back in the design and, or in the requirements phase and in the design phase, we tag user stories that have security implica uh, implications. So we know when it hits verification, that feature needs to be pen tested. Every once in a while, we want to do a full pen test. We also want to do some fuzz testing and dynamic analysis. This is another phase where I would recommend that you kind of break your shoestring budget. Pay someone to pen test your application. A lot of companies will say, well, we've got a guy who knows how to do pen testing in-house. Okay, that's great. How many hours are you going to give one of your developers who knows how to pen test? How many hours will you give that person to test your app? Any, any, any guesses? I mean, do you think you could strip a developer away for eight hours? How about for 60 hours? Okay, it's not going to happen. So this is a place where I recommend making an investment. Maybe it's self-interested because I do a lot of pen testing, but I really recommend that you bring in outside help for two reasons. Number one, your internal staffing requirements will not allow you to de dedicate the amount of time that needs to be dedicated to do a real pen test. Number two, someone who pen tests day in and day out will find stuff that your internal guy won't. That's just the way it works. So, you know, is how often is often enough? Annual is probably the minimal amount that you want to do with a third party. And then depending on the sensitivity of the data you're in or the regulation in your industry, you might want to do it more frequently or a combination. Uh, I have a lot of clients who do their own internal pen testing and then they'll have me do an annual pen test for them. And that works out really well. Okay? So you want to make sure at some point that you're doing some pen testing and this is where I would say you want to spend some money. All right, and in your release phase, again, release is $0 cost to get read, to build into your SDL. You just have to stop and think about it. What are your release gates? We talked about defining the definition of done up front. This is where you make sure you're actually done before you go out the door. So you do your final security review. You make sure you have a response plan. If you've decided to use a vendor for incident response, you make that decision who it's going to be. You make that decision here. Sign the paperwork here. Um, I did an incident response uh, recently where I actually dug in and we, we, we stopped the bleeding, but their internal contracting process took two weeks. And it just sat for two weeks on hold. And their CEO kept asking, what's going on? What's going on? Were we hacked? Were we hacked? Were we hacked? And we kept saying, they kept saying, we don't know yet. We haven't gotten through contracting. So if you're going to contract for an external people, do it, do it now before you need it. Um, and then uh, monitor verification. So this is kind of a weird concept for people that we might actually want to monitor stuff that's going on in production more than just who's clicking where, right? We talk to product owners and their idea of monitoring is mixed panel. Woo! 
I know that users go from here to here to here to here. That's great. Okay? The real monitoring that you want to do is uptime on your servers, right? Because that's important if you're in IT and you're being measured by it. But also, you want to monitor activity. And you don't know if it's going to work. The, you don't want to find out whether it works or not when you push it to production. So here's where you're going to do your final verification of that, and then you do your release sign-off. Okay, this is process-oriented. This requires agreement. If you're in an agile world, how long does it take for you to say, hey, did all of our security user cases get executed? Half an hour of someone looking at it, right? How long does it take to say we have a response plan? Okay, well, you had to write one. And you might have to go and review it. You might have to spend an hour or two reviewing it. Not a lot of time invested there. Um, and monitor verification, that might take a little bit more time. That's some testing to make sure this monitor is going to work and going to integrate into your organization. Hey, interesting side note. So I mentioned I'm working for a, a major financial firm. We just had this big breakthrough because a person that I went to high school with years and years and years ago, well before there was managed code, let's just put it that way, um, is now uh, a sim engineer. And was just hired, and we sort of just realized at some point that we were working at the same major financial firm, which is kind of cool. Anyhow, we were chatting, and I was chatting with one of my coworkers about how I knew this person who was a sim engineer, and he, he was all excited. He's like, oh, that's our phase three. We really want to figure out how to tie our applications into the sim so it actually works. We want to build a living, breathing, almost self-aware system. Okay, that's this concept of what's going on in your release phase. It's a maturity thing. If you're brand new to, to doing a secure development lifecycle, making sure your application team is writing to tie into your SIM is probably not something you're going to do the first time out. Okay. All right, and then in your response uh, phase here, um, you, know, you might spend a little bit of money b buying response tools. The most important thing is to tabletop your response exercise. Uh, case in point, this hack that happened a couple of, of months ago for my client, the IT team had absolutely no clue what they were doing. Their response to their WordPress server being taken over was to reinstall from backup. Okay, What did that do? Well, number one, it reintroduced the vulnerability that caused it in the first place. Number two, it absolutely wiped out every single piece of evidence. The only thing I could tell them was, I have log data up until this date, and I have log data after this date, so clearly you were owned for these 35 days. How? No idea. I can't tell you because I can't look at the logs because you wiped them out. What did they do? I don't know. How did they attack you? I think it was this, right? So if you tabletop your response and include your entire response team, it will be a good idea. What will happen is your IT administrators will realize they're absolutely clueless about what to do during a response. And you'll teach them the five things they can do to preserve evidence. Simple, right? Your management is absolutely clueless. They have no idea how long it takes. I swear, managers think, we're going to call this guy, he's going to come in, an hour later we're going to know what happened, right? It's like I'm pulling my car into the, 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 the tune-up place, and they're going to open the hood and connect a computer to it, and they're going to tell me what's wrong with it. That's not how it works. Incident response takes a, a fair amount of time, especially when you have either a lot of data or no data. Because with no data, I keep looking and looking and looking and looking. Okay? So you really want to spend the time to do a tabletop response. How much does it cost for you to do that? Take an afternoon, buy some pizza, buy some soda, get everyone in a room, come up with a mock incident, and then start talking about it. Okay, how are we going to, where are the logs? What logs do we have? What tools are we going to use to go through those logs? So on and so forth. Okay? All right. We're, we're moving right along. Resources. When it comes to the building an SDL, the whole, I, I love Jack's slide about standing on the shoulders of giants. Don't do your own SDL. Microsoft has three different SDLs that you can work with. They have the Microsoft SDL, which dis really pretty much describes how we built software internal to Microsoft. I, I used to work at Microsoft on that. They have the simplified SDL, which is basically, whoa, that's kind of the crawl, walk, run approach. Simplified SDL is just easier. And then they have the SDL-A, which is um, aimed toward agile SDL activities. BSIM is a great resource as well. And by the way, all of these resources are free. Um, BSIM is, a, is really kind of the SDL that everyone models themselves after. The nice thing is it's a maturity model, which means you can rate yourself in maturity and, and figure out where you are. So if you're just getting into it, 
you'll pick their easiest maturity level. And it's like two or three things from each category. It's pretty easy to do. It represents a great ramp up in your initial six months. That kind of thing. So BSIM is fantastic. And then I mentioned SafeCode earlier. SafeCode has some good documentation. A lot of it's kind of a repeat of what you'll see on, on the Microsoft SDL and BSIM, but they have those user stories, and those user stories are really valuable. If you're sort of a formal, agile shop, those user stories will really integrate well into, the, into your processes. Okay? What are some other resources? Like I said, best $300 you'll ever spend is Burp Suite. I've tried OWASP Z Attack pro Proxy. I'm not really thrilled with it. It doesn't work well for me. Maybe, I don't know. It, I mean, you know, it, it's like um, it just reformatted my, reformatted my Mac. I've been a Lightroom user for years and years and years. I tried Nikon Capture for about 20 minutes and threw it out. I'm sure I can do everything with Capture that I do with Lightroom. It's just that I know how to use Lightroom. Okay, or another analogy, I, used, I skied all through my childhood. When I moved to Utah, I tried snowboarding, and I was like tumbling down these blue circle runs, thinking to myself, why am I doing this? I just want my skis on again. Okay, so you go with what you're comfortable with, but Burp is just an awesome tool. OWASP Developer Guide and the OWASP Tester Guide. If you can read, if you can have your developers read these, or if someone can prepare training for the developers based on these documents, you have gotten probably $20,000 worth of commercial training for free. Just the amount of time it takes to build stuff, you know, build slides around it. Very, very thorough resources. Okay, and then the Microsoft File Fuzzer is an example of a tool that's available out there. So if you have a web application that accepts file formats, use the File Fuzzer. It'll fuzz all, all sorts of different file formats for you, and you'll find all sorts of great problems with your, with your application. Okay, so really the idea here is that, number one, in building an SDL, it's already been done. It's already been thought of. Grab those documents, read through them, pick what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Come up with a plan, we'll talk about this in a second, kind of a step-by-step -step plan to, to get to the point where you're mature with your security. The other idea here is that there are a lot of tools. HP and IBM want you to believe that the only tools out there that are going to work for you are super, super expensive. And they come with a, a forced workflow process. Okay, that's, that's really not true. They're good, true. they're good tools. They were great tools before they got integrated into all the other tools that people want to sell you. Um, but there are tools out there that are inexpensive that work really, really well, or even free. All right, so kind of a, a wrap-up slide here. Things to do yourself. Look, you can do your own training, right? OWASP Developer Guide, Tester Guide, TechNet, Apple Developer, Android, Java. One of the things I was doing was writing the mobile security guidelines. So I wrote, uh, over the course of the last few months, 20 different guidelines that included sample code, how to do things securely. Can you guess where that code came from? Most of it came off the Apple developer website and off the Android site and was then modified. Okay? These are great resources to go for code. When it comes to SDL design, we already talked about that. Tools we've talked about as well. Things to consider buying. It might make sense to pay SANS or someone else to do more advanced stuff. Or if you're really, really pressed for time and you don't have the time to do those basic fundamental training courses, then bring someone in. You can find people who come in and do that relatively affordably. Okay? Requirements, you may want to consider looking to consultants who have expertise in an area that you're moving into if you don't have the expertise there. It's not required. Again, it's a trade-off between time and money. Um, I really feel strongly about static code analysis. Break your bank on static code analysis. Break your bank on pen testing. Have a third party come in and do your pen testing. Right? So how to get started? How are we doing on time? Whew. Scope your project. What are your goals? Why are you doing this? Why do you care about this? Figure that out to determine what you're, the, how you're, you, you know that you're building the right SDL. Okay? Um, if, it's, if it's compliance with a regulatory board, then you're probably going to have to go look and see what their SDL requirements are, as opposed to, we just want to build good, secure code. Congratulations. That's great. Okay, maturity. Start small. Be realistic. Leverage existing knowledge. And then the key here is to document it. Have it written down and have your executives buy in on it and be part of it. Okay? I wrote the most beautiful secure development life cycle I have ever written in my career. I spent, I don't know, a couple of weeks researching it, taking some of the expertise I had at Microsoft and other places and putting it together. And it had absolutely zero support from um, management. So it was shelfware. 
don't don't do these projects without getting approval and buy-in because it's just a waste of your time. You might as well game all afternoon. Designing and implementing your SDL is an iterative process. It's a crawl, walk, run process. Figure out what your goals are. Pick your framework. Figure out what you already do. Find your gaps. Address those gaps. Implement it. And then do it all over again. Step by step by step. Eventually, you'll come to a point where you have enough security. And you'll know that you have enough security. You'll feel right about it. Management will feel right about how much time and money you're spending. You, that's when you know you've arrived, at least for that week. And then the next week, everything will change. Okay? So that's the end of the presentation. Are there any questions that I can answer? Yes? Good and bad examples in a secure, agile environment of what? How to know when you're done? Um, huh, that's a great question. So the bad examples are easy. The bad examples is the, are that you haven't measured anything. Um, the good examples really, I would say, are uh, those teams that push user stories into their rhythm. And in fact, here, I'll show you really quickly here. So in, in Agile, this is the Microsoft diagram. They have this every sp sprint requirement. They have the idea of buckets. So they've got one-time things that you do once for your product design. They have every sprint, things you do for every single sprint, buckets that you do every once in a while. Okay? A good process is where you've defined those items and you're actually following them. What those items are will change by team and by technology and so forth, but that's the best. Really, the idea here is that you're proactive and you've thought your way through it. Oh. Yeah. You should be up here. It's a great answer. Great answer. Good. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you have recommendations for blogging or Do it. Uh, recommendations in, in terms of technology or strategy or all of it? Uh, that could probably be a talk in and of itself. Um, but first, my first recommendation is do it. And start with... You know what's funny? Windows. What's the default logging for Windows um, logins? What does it only log by default? Anyone know? Successful. Okay, so my client got hacked. What is the first thing I do? I go look at the Windows event logs and guess what I find? Nothing! Well, all successes, right? I couldn't find any evidence of failure. <laughs> yeah, so, so log your failures. They're more important. They're more interesting. Repeated failures, right? Or if you're using something like um, IP tables and fail demand, log, your, log things that break the threshold, things that go above the signal-to-noise ratio. Is that helpful? It's a good start. There's, that's a long conversation we could have. Other questions? So let me wrap it all up by saying what I started with. I'm, I can't in an hour teach you what to do in your secure development lifecycle because Number one, there's not enough time. And number two, it's different for everybody. It really should be different for every team. Hopefully, we had a, a really high-level overview of what a secure development lifecycle is, training, requirements, design, implementation, verification, uh, release, and support, right? Um, and then we talked about, I tried to show, hey, look, really all you have to do is think about these things and write down your plan. You don't have to spend a lot of money to get that done. A couple of places where you do probably want to invest money um, but most of it is just stepping back and building an organized approach. And the last thing we talked about were some of your resources out there. There's all of this stuff has been done. It's published. It's free. It's out there. All you have to do is grab it, synthesize it for your organization, and get into it step by step. Crawl, crawl walk, run into it. Okay? Hopefully, I accomplished the mission and you feel like your hour was well spent. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My email address should be on every slide, but it's not, so we'll go back to the beginning here. Um, 
I unfortunately can't stick around today. I've got some things I have to do uh, at work, so I need to leave. Otherwise, you know, grab me in the hallway if you could. But my address is john at infosecure.io, and I, I love to answer questions. Um, I give away, you know, all sorts of information all the time because that's, I, like I said, I'm a terrible consultant. Um, so hit me with an email. Hit me with other, whatever questions you may have. These slides, I will be putting them up on the, what is it, join, join in? site, but I'll also have them on my InfoSecure site in a few days. So you can go there. And actually, I'm going to annotate the notes so there's a little bit more information. Some of the talking points that we had all flesh out. So go grab the slides you know, at some point and, and feel free to ask me any questions. So with that, we're done.